Hey everybody, what's up? First, I want to say thank you uh, for coming to my channel, um, and I hope you enjoy today's lesson. Uh, we are going to be going over king and pawn uh, and knight endgames, uh, just a few, uh, just to get your feet wet. Um, this is a, a vast um, a portion of a chess that is, uh, in my opinion, not uh, looked at enough. So let's get right into it. You can see uh, this position uh, right here. Um, you have black being the stronger side with the pass pawn on um, all the way uh, on the H file and ready to promote. Um, so black is coming down the screen right from top to top to bottom. And all black needs to do here is move his king to uh, G1 or G2 and just simply promote his pawn. You can also see that he has a knight uh, on B8, uh, and white just has a lone king. So here is white to move, and white, of course, is trying uh, to find a draw in the position. So again, you might say, why Why am I showing you such a, um, you know obscure position? Well, there's some lessons here. I'm gonna give you a lesson, um, you know, piece of knowledge here that you'll be able to take for the rest of uh, your chess career. And um, I would ask you the question of how would you play here if you're white? Now, obviously, white must play the move king f1 or king f2. But which one would you choose? Second question is how would you go about it? Are you going to calculate? Uh, say king f2 and then go knight uh, you know c7 I'm sorry knight c6 uh, knight d7 knight a6 there, there will be so much for you to calculate your brain would probably overheat all right like how would you actually figure that out and so this is the reason why I'm showing you this end game is because I want to um, let you know that a lot of these grand masters, international masters, and even masters, um, they use shortcuts when it comes to um, uh, certain end games, right? Uh, just general rules of thumb that are very accurate that you can follow so that you don't have to um, waste um, a whole bunch of time trying to calculate, all right? So... The purpose of these type of simple end games is to show you how to think in chess and show you also how to be accurate because many times um, we might study combinations and, uh, you know, white to move and win and so on. And we find the one move and we're happy. But a lot of times you need to find three, four, five moves in a row. And studying end games helps increase your accuracy. Also, it helps you. Uh, formulate plans in the position and also it helps you to become um, uh, intimate in your knowledge of that particular piece for instance here the king and knight you study knight end games long enough you will be uh, very familiar with the uh, strengths and weaknesses of the knight all right and your knight play will be better in in your um, in your middle games trust me on it um, okay, so let's look at this position. All right. Again, some of you might have guessed, right, it's a 50-50 chance, you know, king f2, king f1, whatever, you know, without really having a method um, or madness to why. Okay, so let's just play the losing move first. Some of you will guess the right move. Some of you will guess the wrong move. King f1. OK, so again, we already know that the, the black king must be kept in the corner. OK, let's see what happens, why this is losing. So after king f1, knight d7, king f2, knight e5, king f1, knight g4. And you can see the white king cannot go to f2 now. OK, and he has to move away and he's going to lose. All right. Now let's look at the winning continuation. I'm sorry, drawing continuation. King f2. So king f2, knight d7, king f1, knight e5, king f2, knight g4, check, 
King F1, Knight E3, and now King F2, the Knight has to go away, and the Knight can just keep checking, but the King uh, gets to stay where it's at. So that um, is fantastic, but it's useless without the underlying principle here. And I want to introduce you to a term that I call color opposition. Now, I haven't heard it anywhere else, so I'm going to claim it and say that I invented this term. Right? We've heard of, uh, you know, king opposition, right, where, uh, you know, the kings face each other, right, one or three or five squares. And we say, you know, there's opposition, long distance opposition, etc. I'm going to call this color opposition uh, when it comes to king um, against knights. And the reason why is because this is very important. All you need to know here to be able to judge this position at a glance is all you need to know is which color the knight is on. So, for example, the knight here being on the dark square on B8, I know that in order to draw, all I do is have to get on the same color as the knight. So, knight is on dark square, king comes to dark square. If that knight was on B7, I would go to F1 and draw immediately. Having this knowledge eliminates calculation for me. All I have to do is look at the position and I already know what to do. Okay? You take the color opposition. So you can see king on dark square. Knight comes. King f1. Knight e5. King f2. Knight g4. King f1. Knight e3. King f2. You see color opposition. You're on the same color as the knight. The reason why you lose in the, this variation because now you pick the wrong color and you're allowing the knight to take the color opposition. So now the knight comes to the light square, you see? Now you're on the dark square, light, uh, now he's on the dark square. You're on the light square, he's on the light square. And then you wind up losing. So just remember that term, color opposition. I know you probably never knew this before. Now you know. And I don't, again, I haven't seen the term anywhere, but it's something that I use. So I'm passing it uh, on uh, to you. So that's end game number one. Uh, again, you might say, hey, I'll never see this type of endgame. Sure you will. Um, there's plenty of situations where the opponent has passed pawn on the sides of the board. There's an, a piece involved. But more so than that, um, it will teach you about the, the weakness of the knight. Knight is not really that good when it comes um, to um, uh, stopping pass pawns or really aiding uh, pass pawns. And we're going to see that in um, uh, future endgames. The general rule with knight and king endgames is that you can pretty much treat them like king and pawn endgames. It's almost like the knight is kind of irrelevant. Of course it's not because it's peace on the board. But as far as far as its effectiveness, it's it's kind of it's pretty it's pretty weak. And as you can see in this particular endgame, if, if white plays correctly, even with the extra piece, black cannot win. You see, that shows you how the weak the knight is. The reason why the weak is knight in these type of positions is because it's not it's not long range piece. Therefore. To attack, it must be close, and to defend, it must be close, right? So that and it, its proximity allows it to be driven away uh, relatively uh, easily. Okay, so there's your first jewel. So remember that color opposition. We're gonna look at another knight um, end game. This this end game, um, black is black to move here. I'm sorry, it's white White to move, excuse me. Uh, white is going up the board, and black is coming down. So that pawn on um, A6 is coming down the board. Um, this is a study by uh, Kuzmechev from 1986. So here, um, again, how would you stop this pawn? Um, right, we know you have to stop it, right? But there's a way to stop it. And lose, and there's a way to way to stop it and hold the game. So I want you to start getting used to like planning ahead, right, and not just uh, playing on instinct. Um, this is kind of the downside of playing a lot of blitz is that you just play on instinct. Like for instance, if you play a move like King B3 and just go after the pawn, you'll lose the game. 
All right. Um, you need to plan here and find out what's important. The important thing in this position is to recognize that, hey, if black is able to support that pawn, anchor that pawn with the knight, then you're going to lose. All right. Um, sim simple as that. Uh, the king is far away right now, so you need to exploit that time in order to attack this pawn. So basically, white is faced with uh, two duties here. One is to attack the pawn, right? He must he must uh, win that pawn before black can uh, protect it with the knight. And two, he must keep the knight from protecting it. How is he going to do that? Let's look at the losing continuation first. So king b3, right? Caveman style, going straight after the pawn. King b3, knight e3, king b4, knight d5 check, king a5, and knight c7, and now you're lost. The reason why is because if white goes after the knight, right, the knight just stays there as a decoy, and when white captures the knight on c7, then the pawn will race down the board. This is why you lose, and you can see that this square c7 is very powerful. Okay, remember what I said about the knight. The knight is, is a bad piece when it comes to defending uh, pawns because of his close proximity. So therefore, in this situation, if black's knight gets behind the pawn, then he can stay there and just be a decoy. So what white wants to do is create a situation where the knight cannot defend the pawn from behind. Okay. So let's look at the correct continuation. King C3. Now, why is King C3? King C3 is great because, or why is King C3 the correct move? King C3 is great because it kills two birds with one stone. There's another lesson for you. Econ economics, right? You want to make economical moves. You want to make the moves that do the most. So in essence, there's nothing wrong with King B3, right? In, you know, in, in, in theory, right, you're doing a great thing. You're going after the pawn. However, king c3 is better because you're going after the pawn and you're hindering the other plan of the knight being able to protect that pawn on uh, uh, a6. So king c3, you might say, how, is, how does that go um, attack the pawn? You're, you're going away from the pawn. Well... Look, from our starting position here, after first, after king b3, notice it takes one, two, three moves to get to the pawn. If we go to c3, same thing. One, two, three. Right? So if we've accomplished the same objective. Right. But we've gotten a little more out of our move. Right. We're accomplishing two things. And like I said, the second thing is very important is we're keeping that knight from getting behind the pawn. So game will continue. Knight e3. And now king d4. Very powerful move because it prevents knight to d5. Remember that leap before that we saw. Um. And the other variation, d5 to c7. Now, that's not possible. So, the knight has to go back. Knight c2, king c5, and now we can start attacking the pawn again. King e5, king b6. Now what? Only move to hold on is knight, b5, knight b4. And now you can see from here, there's no way for black to hold the pawn. Because now the weakness of the knight is exposed. The weakness of the knight being that in order to protect has to be in close proximity and since it is in front of the pawn it can be attacked white can afford to capture the knight and then go back and capture the pawn at this point all right so that is the difference all right next example and i hope you're enjoying these uh simple end game now here is a study by a former world champion max erva who uh defeated uh al yekin um, in 1935 and of course lost the rematch in 1937 but here is a study that he made now is white to move here and you got the same situation where white is trying to protect this pawn 
white is going up the board you can see the king is all the way on h1 so the king is you know uh Irv is telling you hey the, the white king is really not that important in this particular situation so let's see what happens so here knight a5 is played right so here the knight is used to anchor the pawn long enough and remember what i was saying about using the knight as a decoy so here the knight is used to anchor the pawn long enough until the white king can protect it. All right. Again, if you just take a moment to look at it, there's there's uh, other ways that white can try to anchor this pawn. So, for instance, right, the knight can go here. Right, that's a possibility. Okay, but you can see immediately that you know the black king would just go to c5 and capture the knight. All right. Another possibility is another possibility is the C5. And again, you can see that after a move like D5, uh excuse me, King D5 and um sorry about that. You can see after King D5 and um you know, followed by uh king to c6 again same situation so you will reject those and you can see that blacks uh white's only hope really is knight uh a5 here okay so the pawn is protected now white has bought some time uh remember the knight is not that good at protecting the pawn so this is a decoy situation so king c5 and now the king comes out from the corner king g2 king b4 King f3, king takes a5, and this is where you need to know your king and pawn endgames. And that's another video altogether, but I'll tell you from here that white is winning. And if you understand the theory of critical squares, some people call them key squares. But if you understand the theory, you can tell white is winning uh, from here. Okay, so basically the reason why white is winning is because white can get to one or one of these one of these three squares here right black cannot stop him in this case it will be the uh, d5 square that white is able to reach so king e4 king b6 king d5 and therefore he forces black into a lost situation by gaining the opposition so if you didn't know your your uh, square theory here and say you play king e4 king b6 and you know you play the move like this then all of a sudden um you know you're you're uh you know giving uh white uh a draw because now black covers those three squares in front of the pawn So look at the next one. Let's adjudicate that. This is another position by Zeppler. Um, and this is going to be a similar position to one we're going to look at at the end. But again, this position just shows the weakness of the knight when it comes to stopping past pawns. All right. So in this case, black king is far too far away to help. All right. And I'm not going to explain the moves of the king, the white king right now. Uh, we'll get into detail later because there's a similar position coming up. So basically king d3, king g2, king c4, king f3, king c5. Again, white is going up the board, of course. King e4, king c6, knight a8, and king b7. And you can see the black king's too far away. The knight gets captured and then the promotion. Right. Going back to color um, opposition, this is one of the few instances where where a king and knight can mate. Um, black must have must have a pawn, right? So basically, he kind of kills himself here, um, and basically it happens by four thugs wing. So in this position, is white to move. So first thing is king c1, and notice right now that the black king and the white knight are in the same squares 
right? And I'm showing you in this position because I want to reinforce the color opposition again between king and knight. So after king c1, a3 is forced, and now knight c2 check, okay? So this is an important idea to force the, um, the color opposition, right? So just like you want, you want to take the opposition with the king, here white wants to take the opposition with the knight. So he forces the, the, um, in the color opposition too. Not, not necessarily the king being in, uh, knight being in front of the king, but the, on the same color. So you can see the king now is forced on the light square. And now knight d4. So again, this is one of the characteristics of the knight that when the knight moves, the knight alternates colors. This makes the color opposition more complicated. So after knight d4, king a1, it's black who has the color opposition again, right? Because he's now taking the, uh, the square. However, white using his king can force um, black to give up the opposition. So he goes king c2, king a2. And you can see here, he's for he forces himself uh, black is forced to give up the opposition. He goes to the light square, and now knight e2. Notice the knight is on the light square. He takes the color opposition against the black king. King a1, knight c1, and notice how uh, white's knight has a color opposition, right? So king goes to the dark square, knight goes to the dark square. A2 is forced, and now comes the mate. There you go, another example of color opposition with knights and king. A study by Grigoriev. This, this position allows, um, th this is an interesting position because uh, it's just the position of a black king uh, allows the, the, the knight to, to come to the rescue here. So again, that you can see the black pawn is already uh, on white's fourth rank and basically coming down the board to to queen. So how how to stop this pawn? Okay, again the caveman method of just directly attacking the pawn. Knight g6 is going to lose. H3, knight f4, h2, um, knight e2, king d2, knight g3. It looks good, but again you're in that situation. As that we saw a few um, positions ago, where the king, the white king, is too far away to protect the knight. And then king f2, the knight gets driven away, or the knight gets captured. You see, so when it comes to protecting pawns, you can see that the knight is suspect. The knight needs the knight is only like a temporary stopgap. If the king can't get there in time, then then you know you're 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 going to be in some trouble. You're going to lose the piece. All right. This is why, uh, you know, just uh, going off on a little tangent into Nimzovich, this is why he talks about outposts, right? Knight having outposts because the knight, um, due to his character, needs, you know, needs to be so close to attack and defend. Um, that also makes it easy to drive away, and that's why you need, you need anchors and outposts, right? It's not like a bishop where you could just move the bishop or, or a rook to the other side of the board and you're still attacking the same point so here knight f7 right a little more sophisticated h3 knight g5 h2 knight e4 check king c2 and now knight g3 okay um again i'm gonna i'm not gonna go into detail in the explanation of this end game i'm gonna come back i'll come back to it because after I, I feel like after I explain the last one, you'll understand the reasons why. Because I know some of you are saying, well, why not F, knight F2 and this and that? Because all it has to do, you know, just to give you a general explanation, is that there's two scenarios. If knight, if the knight has, um, depends, of course, on the position of the uh, enemy king. But if the knight has forks or not, is very important. If there's no forks... If the knight doesn't have forks available at some point, then the general policy is to keep the knight as far as possible from the king. 
So for instance, in this position, he can go to F2 or G3 to try to stop the pawn. However, if he does, if he goes to F2, he's only two squares away. The black king is only two squares away from capturing the knight. If he goes to G3, the knight, um, the knight is three squares away. So having that extra tempo is very important because again, you need the king to come to the rescue. And you can see here, see the king is able to get there in time. If we take that one temp, that one um, tempo away, knight f2, you see, king d2, king d6, king e2, and uh oh, knight gets captured. All right, let's go to the next one. Okay, this is going to be the last position. You can see there's a lot of graphics and stuff like that. I went crazy with the graphics. I was just like messing around. Um, <laughs> but anyway, this position by Selman, uh, 1941. All right. Again, similar type position, black pawn racing down the board. You can see the king on C8, knight on A, um, I'm sorry, H8. And it looks lost for all intents and purposes. After all, how can you get, you know, get there in time? All right. First thing you have to ask yourself again is... How do I go about stopping this pawn? Do I play knight g6? Right? Because obviously it's the knight. You're not gonna have, you're not gonna be able to get there in time with the king. So it has to be a knight move to start out with. So it's a knight g6, knight f7. Okay. Again, usually the caveman approach, the, the most primitive approach, is not gonna work here. You have to take time, sit on your hands, not rush, and think think of what's uh, what's going on in this position when I look at this position I know that I either want my knight on g3 Right or I want my knight on f2 reason why is it because it controls h1 so I know I need needed to be on one of those squares Which one? The square that I want it on is going to depend on whether I have forks forking possibilities or not if I don't have any forking possibilities, right? And I'll and I'll get into that uh, shortly. If I don't have any possibilities to fork the king, then I want my knight to be as far away from the king as possible. Okay. So first, let's just dismiss this idea of knight g6. Okay. And you can see the the pathway I have here. Knight g in yellow. Knight g6. F4. H3. F2. It's too slow. You can see that black is three moves from queening. And it's going to take four moves for white to get his knight where it needs to go. And you can see that's an easy win for black. All right. So knight g6 is out of the question. All right. So knight f7. So after knight f7, obviously h3. However, again, same scenario, knight g5, then simply h2, knight e4, and either the g, uh, g3 or f2, and again, that's too slow, all right? That means we need to throw a check in here. So again, just to show you, if knight g5, h2, okay, it's too slow. If knight h6 h2 so these moves are forced knight d6 check all right now black's response is not forced first i'm going to show you typical you know standard move king c6 right so king c6 gains the opposition against the king remember we're not talking about color opposition here now we're just talking about regular king on king opposition so in this particular move Black is attacking the knight on d6, and he has opposition against the king. So he's making it hard for the king to even come back up the knight. Because what did we say earlier? The knight needs some kind of backup, right? The knight can't hold off the um, the pawn, the pass pawn by itself forever. All right. So we already established that. Okay. Another thing I said earlier too is that typically you can treat these type of end games in the same manner you would treat a uh, king and pawn end games. All right. So here 
I have it highlighted that the knight is faced with the choice of either, again, you know, after e4, going to g3 or f2. Which one? So here, for instance, knight e4, h2, and you can see I have those squares highlighted again. And let's say knight g3. And so what, what's the purpose of these boxes here? Okay, these boxes represent the radius of, of, of control that the knight has. All the squares highlighted in green are the places where the black king cannot go because the um, knight controls uh, those squares. All right. The yellow arrow represents the path or the shortest pathway, uh, rather, for the black king to come and attack the knight. So you can see that um, in three moves, black would be able to attack the knight. All right. Now, this is problematic for white because, again, the position of white's king is bad and he won't be able to back up the knight in time. All right. And you can see also on G3, there's no forks available. And what do I mean? I mean a situation where the knight can check the king and threaten to capture the pawn on H2 at the same time. All right. And here you can see a glaring weakness again in the knight's defense is that it's very approachable. Right. So this variation could go king D6. King d8, right? You're trying to get the king involved. And now king e5, king e7. There's the attack. King h1, king f3, king f6, king g2. And you can see that it's all over uh, for uh, white in this position, right? The knight cannot hold on. And again, remember, remember this position. Now I'm going to show you the other choice, f2. Again, the green squares represent the radius of control that the knight has, all right? The red squares represent forking possibilities. In other words, if the black king is on any of these um, red squares, or I don't know what color that, maroon, maybe? But if the black king is on any of these red highlighted squares, this means that white can play the move knight g4 and fork the king and the pawn on h2 and thus draw the game so with these extra defensive possibilities right this gives the uh white extra time in order to bring his king in the game and that's what the difference is in this variation with knight f2 as opposed to knight g3 so again the green highlighted arrow shows the path or the shortest path rather that black must take in order to attack the knight and you can see by counting right d6 that's one e6 two then he has to cut through this diagonal and f f5 that's three um four five so black needs five moves in order to get to the knight so with these extra moves again and if you count here one two three so black has gained two moves i'm sorry white has gained two moves by playing the move with knight f2 so let's look what happens after knight f2 so king d6 so black must walk the minefield here King e6, king c6, right? He has to avoid the forks. King d5, king f4, king d4, king f3, knight h1, king g2, king e3, king takes h1, and voila, look at that. King f2, and we have a stalemate. And that's the difference between knight g3 f2 in that situation let's go back to the game because remember i showed you the variation where black plays king c6 first king b6 
Very strong move. And this is because white black is treating this like a king in porn endgame, right? What he wants to do is he wants to gain opposition against the um he wants to gain opposition against the, the king. So if the king be six, ninety four, h two, knight f two, we already established that being the best move here. And now he plays king c six. Notice he gets the opposition now, king c six. And again, all the highlights represent the same thing as it did before. And basically what Black's idea is, is to basically gain the time back by keeping the opposition. So what he wants to do is play King D6, King E6, while keeping white on the White's king on the back rank at the same time. So for example, say King D8, you know, the white king wants to get involved, King D6. And again, there's the, the pathway that the king must take. So notice here in this position, he's, he's gained some time. So now he's only four squares. He's only four squares away. Before he was five squares. Now he's four squares away. The white king is still on the back rank. And most importantly, he has the opposition. Notice how he's stepping in front of the king. Let's say king e8, right? Again, he has the opposition. King e8. And then he would be lost. King F8. And now he would just, now at the convenient time, black no longer needs the opposition. He would play King F5, King F7, King F3. And notice he has the two squares in, in between. White is not able to catch up. And he would lose in this manner. This is why black plays king b8 here because he's playing just for the opposition now. However, white has ace up his sleeve. So after king b8, I'm sorry, after knight f2, king uh, c6, white plays this move king b8 instead of, instead of going to d8, right? Because we already see that loses. There's nothing he can do about that. So instead... King B8. So you might say, wow, that's that's crazy. You know, it's counterintuitive because he's going away from the pawn. But what it is, is that he is give he's um get he's uh, um going to how can I say this? He's gonna exploit the fact that black has to take a um a determined pathway to get past the knight. Remember, the knight has forks. The knight has like a little force field. I should have drew diagrams here, but um, I trust you can keep them in mind. Yeah, here, here they are. So you got to look at it like this. The knight has like a force field and this this is like, like a minefield. So black has to take a determined pathway to get to the knight. So white is going to exploit that, that black only can go a certain a certain pathway so white is going to exploit that in order to gain the opposition to take the opposition from um from black so watch it so king b8 king d6 king b7 king e6 remember black doesn't really have that much choice right and if he wants to try to win so now King C6, see how he, he gains the opposition. King F5, King D5, look at that. And it's a dead draw. King F4, King D4. And you can see that white is able, uh, able to draw here after King F3, then just simply Knight H1. And the same uh, position would result whereby um, the king uh, would be trapped in the corner. So just beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful uh, ending, uh, ending there. And like I say, you learn a lot from studying uh, those kind of endings there. So um, there's many more, many, many, many more uh, endings that we we could look at. But um, again, uh, that was just a brief uh, foray into the world of of night endings. 
Um, and you can learn a lot from study. Again, I hope you en enjoyed this video. I hope uh, that I was able to pass on uh, some some fundamental lessons that you can um, you know try to improve on and add uh, to your chess game. Any questions or comments or suggestions, uh, please leave them uh, in the comment box. I have about 700 videos on this site. Um, I'm recently recently changed my format. You know, try to update things a little bit, right? Show my face, uh, uh, you know, because I've always tried to concentrate more on the content, but, you know, the presentation has to be on point too. So I'm hoping that you enjoy that also. Um, please take into heart the quote above uh, by Capablanca. Uh, very, I, I mean, I, t I take that to heart. End games, definitely, definitely uh, important. Um, also, if you notice, there's a player below, um, if you know who that is, if you know, I'm always going to put like a chess player that either that, uh, you know, I've uh, met at some point or maybe, uh, just observed the game. Um, but if you know who that is, you know, let me know in the comment section, uh, below, I'll give you a, a shout out, you know, on the next video, um, also, check the links below. Please support my channel. There's a donation link uh, below. And also, there'll be links to DVDs and books always that I find interesting and relevant to the material uh, that I've just presented. So, in this case, it'd be about Endgame. So, again, as usual, please like, subscribe, share, all that good stuff. And um, uh, thank you again uh, uh, for listening and participating uh uh in uh in our channel today all right and i'll see you soon in the next video